Hi, my name is Paul Friedman. I founded the Marriage Foundation. Today's topic is going to turn out to be the most important video possibly you have ever watched in your life so far. And the reason being is this. You are in a place now where you don't want to make a mistake. The topic is what happens in a marriage counseling session that I should worry about. Now I'm not going to just cover the session. I'm going to give you insight into what should be happening. Insights into marriage that you don't already know about. So take a moment here so you know about the Marriage Foundation. I used to be a divorce mediator. Over 20 years ago, I realized that too many people were coming to me for a divorce who really should not be getting a divorce. They had already gone through marriage counseling. Virtually all of my clients, I had a very good lucrative practice and I believed in divorce, but I didn't believe in people getting a divorce unless they needed one. And just too many of them didn't need one. So we've prepared this video for you because it's important. So we're going to start with an understanding of why you got married in the first place. This is important. So pay attention because these are things you didn't think about, which is crazy. You got married, both of you got married for the same two reasons, even though you didn't talk about it. Number one, you wanted to be happier. I'm not talking about why you married your husband or wife. I'm talking about why you wanted to get married in the first place. You want to be happier. Ironically, this is never discussed in our lives. As we grow up, we get married for all these other sub reasons. The second reason we get married is so that we could experience unconditional love. Now, love is not an increased like. This is something that is false. If you Google what is love, that's what they'll tell you. If you talk to a therapist, they'll tell you it's an emotion that is an increased like, but that's not what it is. You know that to be true because you've experienced real love. It's very tangible. It's very real. And think of it this way. Your mind cannot comprehend love. That's why one of the reasons why it's so overwhelming. The reason we're able to experience love in this way is because we're human beings. The reason we can experience happiness, this is important, that is not dependent on outer conditions, is because we're human beings. We have free will. So it stands to reason that when you got married, you would apply your free will. You would apply your volition, which is free will in action, to accomplishing these two things, happiness and love. The reason why that didn't happen is, number one, you never thought of that. Number two, no one goes into marriage thinking, here's what we need to do. They learn things about getting along. Sometimes they learn about making sure we raise the kids right, stuff like that, mundane stuff. But we don't learn about the essence of marriage. This is where the Marriage Foundation has now come onto the scene to educate people. That was over 20 years ago that I was a divorce mediator. And a friend of mine, I used to speak at Second Saturday, it's a divorce support group for women and now for men. And a friend of mine, a fellow mediator, was listening to my stuff, read the first book and said, Paul, you got to take this 
into the world as a foundation. Here's a thousand bucks. Make it a nonprofit. I said, okay, and that's what we did. We are delivering a message that goes beyond hope. It is a message of the reality of marriage and your marriage has fallen off that path, off of that track. And so you're going where most people go. You're going to marriage counseling. That's what we know. That's what we're taught. But we're not taught about the dangers of marriage counseling. And I'm not talking about a little bit. Because the truth is that marriage counseling fails to help people have a happy and loving marriage. Now let's get into this. What is there to worry about? Number one, because if you go to marriage counseling, you will fail at some level. And trust me, over 20 years, we've seen it all. Some people say, yeah, you know, we got along a little bit better for a little while. They had an extraordinary marriage counselor. Most people made things worse. So imagine that you're going to marriage counseling and let's just talk about the possibility of failure. And I'm going to help you if you still at the end of this video think, well, you know, he's competition. So of course he's going to put him down, but I'm going to give you some ideas for how to protect yourself. So number one, the biggest thing to worry about is if you do fail in marriage counseling, what will that mean to you? Well, people don't go into marriage counseling at the beginning of their problems. So you already have a shelf load of problems. Now, I call those symptoms because if your marriage is properly functioning, and this is common sense, right? If your marriage is properly functioning, you don't have this problem and that problem. You don't have infidelity. You don't have arguments that get out of control. You don't have ill feelings. You don't have tension in the gut because everything's working. A properly working marriage only has good symptoms. So failure will increase the trend of your marriage towards divorce. It's the law of momentum. When things are going good and you know what you're doing and you increase those efforts that create the good, then you're building momentum in the right direction. But if you are doing things that are hurting your marriage, which obviously you are, and then you go to marriage counseling with the idea we're going to nip this in the bud, although the bud happened a long time ago, frankly, and you can't, what's going to happen? One, the trend is going to pick up because you still haven't learned what to do to heal your marriage. Marriage counseling doesn't talk about marriage. They talk about things that are happening. They're talking about your interactions. They're talking about the problem du jour, the problem of the day. Also, and this is a really tragic thing that happens. And it's tragic because it's unnecessary. The tragic thing is that you lose hope. You lose hope for yourselves as a couple. You may even lose hope for yourself as an individual. And again, people come to us at the Marriage Foundation. We hear it all. You could even write in to our counselors go to our website, you could write in and ask what they think about what's going on. But basically, people are losing hope. I cannot tell you how many people come to us and say, I'm willing to try anything. I don't mind being the try anything group because our results are great. But if you go to marriage counseling, you may be so discouraged 
that you don't try anything anymore. It's done. And it's a shame because 98% of the time your marriage can be saved. Not just saved, but gotten back onto the right track of happiness and love. Don't forget this. Never forget that you got married for happiness and love. And what has happened, the number one killer in the marriage, is over familiarity. Where you take each other for granted. You don't talk to each other lovey-dovey anymore. You don't consider one another. You argue with each other. You play games, passive-aggressive, aggressive, distractive. It's all there. None of it should have been there, but it's there now. You'll question whether your marriage is worth it. You know, this is what's happening in our society. The divorce rate is up. It's over 51, 52%. But I'll tell you what's worse. You don't know this because you're not in the industry like we are. And that is that more people are not getting married. They're moving in together. Fortunately, at the Marriage Foundation, we consider being together, cohabitating as married. Because who gets to define marriage anyway? Although there are benefits to having that ticket. There are. I'm not going to deny that. But that's for another video. I don't want you to be discouraged. Because when you know how to drive your marriage, it produces happiness and love, but at a level you have never experienced. The people who take our courses find this to be true. The happiness increases every day. I mean, there's a tipping point. First, they have to stop the downward cycle. They have to be learning at the same time how to behave, how to think, literally how to think. And then they start seeing things are getting better. And normally people experiment a little with the old ways and they realize really quickly that's not working and they get back on the path that we get them on and their marriage just gets better and better and better. We still get messages from people who worked with us back in 2008, 2009, because that's as far back as we go having our courses online. And they tell us, wow, I can't believe it, but it's getting better and better. It's supposed to get better and better. So there is a mechanical aspect to literally everything, not just physically but metaphysically too, spiritually. We know that. We know that if we pray, we feel better. If we think well of someone, it has a positive effect. Cause and effect still works. Marriage is a spiritual path, by the way. And I'm not pushing any religion here, that's for sure. But what could be more spiritual than love? And your whole marriage is supposed to be based in, founded upon love, right? Okay, number two. This is big. People who go into sessions with a counselor typically come out of those sessions thinking less of their partner than when they went in. This is a big thing to worry about. You don't want to think less of each other. You want your marriage to be based on mutual respect, love, consideration, all positives. But what happens is you go into these sessions and it's human nature that the first thing that happens is you compete. He or she is worse than me. Everyone goes, look, I ran sessions. I know. I did it as a divorce mediator. And then when I started learning about the truth about marriage, I met with couples. And I quickly ended that, started meeting just with individuals. But that's another video. What happens 
when you have two people in a room who are going into that room with a mediator, let's not call your therapist anything less than a mediator because that's what they end up being. They want to know what's up. Because you want to be taken seriously, you're going to literally exaggerate the problems, your feelings, your resentments, your angers. And you know what happens in those situations? What happens is because you speak it, your ears are hearing you. It's getting fed into your mind from what your mind considers a reliable source, which is you, and it piles it up. It exaggerates it further because your mind trusts you. <laughs> you notice how I say your mind? That's how you should see your mind too because you're a soul. You don't have one. You are one and you have a mind just like you have a body. And so you're hearing these things that you are saying about your husband or your wife and you're going, yeah, yeah, you're agreeing. Your mind is agreeing. It makes it worse. So now you start out by competing. You want to be sure that the therapist really knows your position because you are right and they're wrong. Isn't that true? Isn't it true that when you go into counseling and if it's not true for you, you're unusual to a high degree. Most people go in thinking they're perfect. They may have a few flaws they need to straighten out, but it's my wife. It's my husband. And you go into counseling and here's the proof. And a counselor is going, wow, I could probably stretch this out for months. When I first trained counselors, marriage counselors, I started with 25. And I fired four or five of them because they confided in me. Oh, I've had this couple coming for 11 months. I went, 11 months, my God. When I worked with people, if they weren't done in two or three sessions at the most, some of them had to come back and see me a few months later just to tie things up. But this is before the course. But as a counselor, your counselor should be totally working to help you have happiness and love. There it is again, happiness and love. And you should be doing things right from the very beginning that are producing happiness and love. And you should be stopping right from the beginning those things that hurt your happiness and love. And your counselor should lay out milestones and say, here's the process we're going to go through. And at the end of this session, you will be doing this, you won't be doing that, you'll be doing this, you won't be doing that. And you should start to recognize a lowering of the tensions. Very first session, that should happen. Never happens. Never happens. You're in a competition. You're judging each other, which is the opposite of loving behavior. You're being critical of each other, which is the opposite of loving behavior. And your therapist is going, I could stretch this one out. And you're going, why am I even bothering here? He or she is never going to come around without realizing neither of you know how to be married and neither does your counselor. So what will happen is both of you will be seen in a lesser light. Furthermore, if you have a good counselor, when you're asked to take responsibility for your own behaviors, because you're not going to see yourself because you're not in individual therapy where you've asked the therapist to do your job, which is self introspection. And so the finger pointing galore, finger pointing galore, it's not good. 
Okay, number three, your married life will be even more muddled. It's sort of like taking fake medicine. If you've got a disease and you take medicine, there's an expected return for your efforts of taking that medicine. You expect to feel better. And if you don't feel better, it muddles first your mind, and then because you're already in blaming mode, it's gonna muddle your whole marriage. Because it's not just you, it's your spouse doing the exact same thing as you. And it just gets worse. Another reason why it muddles your marriage is because the last thing counselors ever talk about are love and happiness. Ironic, isn't it? Now that we've talked about this a while and you're finally accepting, I hope that that's what marriage should be all about. If it's not, you've come to the wrong place, trust me. But it, if it should be that, because it's our birthright as human beings to experience happiness and love, or we wouldn't have those gifts that we have. So now what's happened is, I'm gonna to have to explain this a little bit, okay? So bear with me. As a human being, you have a body, you have a mind, and you are a soul, all right? Now, your body, as you know, is comprised of trillions of cells embedded in every single cell which defines it as being alive is the drive to survive you know this already right acknowledge this it's important so all of the cells combine they create a force and this force wants to use this the central processing unit the mind to do its bidding of survival. Survival can be boiled down to just a couple of things. Number one, don't kill me. And that manifests as fear, caution. Number two, let's increase ourselves, propagation, procreation. It's just part of the drive to survive. And number three, is where is the opportunity for those things that will create security? Food, money, a good job, things like that. So the business of the body, you might say, its whole life is all about survival. And it's constantly reminding the mind Hey, dude, we have to survive. Hey, miss, we got to survive. The mind responds to this in very selfish ways. If you were strictly responding to that, if you weren't a soul mitigating these ideas of survival, like wanting to kill someone, wanting someone to be her, wanting to steal what they have, You'd be a psychopath. That's what a psychopath is. They're living on this lowest level, this primal level, without allowing goodness to creep in. Most of us live on a mundane level where we have mitigated those thoughts. We have reason. We have a conscience, which by the way, is the silent voice, I'm sorry, the speaking voice of the silent God. It's how God talks to you through your conscience. It's not buried deep in your subconscious. It's God speaking to you through your conscience. And he's saying, yes, no, you should be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. And it mitigates, it changes the primal directive of your body telling your mind to do this and do that. But we're human beings. We are souls. We have an opportunity 
to live in love. You want to define your soul? Love. A chip off the old block. God. It's love itself. But it's distracted by the body. Sort of like the game of life is this war between your body and your soul taking place in your mind. And you have free will. You get to choose all the time. Most of us live on a mundane plane of existence where we're injecting a little bit of love to mitigate our primal urges. But when you get married, you have this amazing opportunity. And this is so important for you to know. You have this opportunity to enjoy marital bliss. There is such a thing. But you have to know how to master your mind. That's the very first thing we deal with in the courses we have for both men and women. How do you master your mind? You cannot have a great marriage until you have learned to master your mind. I can't tell you how many emails we get a day where people go, tell me what to do. This is my circumstance. We will never tell you what to do. You have free will. We don't mess with your free will. You have innate wisdom. We're not going to interfere with that. You see the world and life and your place in it in a particular way. You are the one responsible for your evolution. Only by exercising through these challenges can you evolve as a human being. When you do, you feel happiness. Yeah. When you are a servant to your wife, a servant to your husband, because you love them, and you can make your love bigger. People don't know this. You can increase your love. You can increase your devotion. You can increase your loyalty. You're not an automaton. You have power. You have free will. They don't teach you this in marriage counseling. You spend all your time on mundane problems. Oh, my husband's looking at porn. Oh, my wife won't have enough sex with me. Does it sound like I'm mocking? Because I am. Because when you realize who you are, how much power you have, how much opportunity you have, you will mock those things too. You will realize, are you kidding me? I don't have to be a victim of these primal ambitions, these urges. I'm in charge of my mind. First step. First step. They don't take you there. They don't take you there. Look, they too are driven by the drive to survive. Meeting people is how they make a living. You're a paycheck for them. You think there's not a subconscious, at least, tendency to stretch out these sessions? Sure there is. Now, number four. Most counselors, and I'm going to say inadvertently, they don't mean it. Look. When I say they stretch out the sessions, it's subconscious. They're not doing it on purpose. Some do. I fired those. But you're not going to be able to know. And they inadvertently, because they're human beings, they'll take sides. They can't help but judge. They'll judge, just like you judging, just like you're blaming. They will take in X amount of information. They can't read minds. It's not what they do. They can't figure out all that's going on by the little bit of information they're going to get in 40 minutes, 20, 10 minutes. And they're going to form judgments. They're going to take sides. Now, look what's happening. Now, you're in a position of superiority. I know I didn't pronounce that right, but give me a break. Over your spouse. You're not supposed to be superior to your spouse. You're supposed to be a humble lover of your spouse, their chief supporter. And what are they going to do? 
they're going to get defensive. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? And then, what happened to marriage counseling bringing you together? So let's ask that question. What is marriage counseling for? Obviously, to help your marriage. Da da da. What does that mean? It means to bring you back together. Back to a place of loving one another with all your heart, mind, and soul like you did when you got married. These are not actions that will do that. And therein lies the problem. Okay. So they take sides. Both of you lose when they do. Both of you. Number five. This is probably the most important. And it's very sad. I was at a Starbucks in Orange County. And uh, this lady and her little kid came in. And I was working on my book this many, many years ago. And she asked what I was working on. And, uh, you know, I told her, I said, you know, I run the Marriage Foundation and da 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 da. And she said, you know, I am a marriage counselor. I am an MFT, but I really don't like where things are going. So well, where are they going? And she said, well, they're talking about the kids who will be fine after a divorce. That took me back. Because if you research the statistics, the real statistics, not the articles, but the real statistics, for 60 years, we have known un questionably, irrefutably, that kids get destroyed by divorce. Some more, some not as more, but everyone gets hit hard. You talk to any old teacher, not the young ones who may be brainwashed, and they'll tell you. They always knew when there was a problem at home because the kids would perform more poorly. Their friendships would break down. They were the first to get into drugs and alcohol. Many of them got into earlier sex. They tried shoplifting. They tried things that they shouldn't, that we shouldn't, that nobody should because divorce affects your children, period, period. And now the trend is to discount that, to literally say, well, they'll be okay, but I could meet with them if you'd like. They won't be okay. So let me sum this up. Yes. The Marriage Foundation, you could say we are competition for marriage counselors, but I don't see it that way. I have friends who are marriage counselors. I like them as people. But you know, there comes a time when society has to make a shift. Do you know what they did to Galileo in 1500s? It was during the Inquisition. And he was so audacious, he said, our world is not the center of the universe. They wanted to kill him, but he was too famous. He invented the telescope. So they put him under house arrest till the day he died. The world moves slowly because certain things, certain professions become institutionalized and, they, and if they're wrong, all of us suffer. Western psychology, has pretty much been the go-to for marriage help. The other go-to has quit giving marriage help, which was clergy. And they quit because they have plenty else to do. But the marriage therapists make a living. And they do it on false sciences. Now, they're really good at identifying certain things, 
Like they could tell someone's a psychopath. They could tell someone's a narcissist, someone, you know, they, they label, and that serves a purpose. But healing, marriages, no. The absolute truth is that their success rate, not how do their clients like them, but their success rate for helping marriages stay together is below 5%. That's the truth. You may have to do a lot of research to get to that number because they hide it, but that is the truth. Now there's other organizations besides us who teach people how to be married. Even they have better success rates. Ours is in the high 90s and we're able to guarantee our work. And the reason we do that is because we want people to try we're not sure. We don't want you to give up. For me, it's a philosophical thing. I believe the world is a better place when the family unit is intact, when the center of the family is the light of love and harmony and happiness. That's what we want for you. I do hope that this was useful for you. Please write a comment. I always get comments when I do a video like this from therapists, but you know what they say to me? You don't have the credentials. And you know what? I don't care. Therapists are the odd ones in school who had emotional problems and they couldn't find some help, so they went that route. I didn't have those problems as a kid. I was a divorce mediator. I got into this because I saw their failures. And so I don't have their credentials. Mine are superior. And I want you to have a happy marriage. My name is Paul Friedman. I founded the Marriage Foundation. And I do hope you join me again. Subscribe to the channel. Give a like. Give a comment. God bless you. I pray for you. And take care.